so we can have uh, however long that is. So um, anyway, take advantage of that. God is good. Amen. Amen. Look at Acts chapter two, verse seventeen. Acts chapter two, verse seventeen and eighteen. Chapter two, seventeen and eighteen. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would be honored this morning. And that God, that your word would speak. That word of God, we ask that you would come forth and that you would change hearts and change our minds, change the way we process, the way we think. God, you have a strategy. You have a plan. You have a purpose. So Father God, I pray that this morning, today, this is the day that you have made so we will choose to be glad. We will choose to rejoice. No weapon formed against us will prosper, God. No deception, no attack. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So, Father God, I just give to you all distraction. We give to you all thoughts, all the things that would harness or hold us back. And God, we pray for hope. And we pray for expectancy. And God, we have faith to believe in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. the world says, don't get your hopes up. Don't get your hopes up. Hey, my kid's going to get a scholarship to college. Don't get your hopes up. Hey, my wife's cooking something good for dinner tonight. Don't get your hopes up. Hey, my boss is going to give us, let us out early today. Hey, don't. The world cautions us, cautions us about getting our hopes up. I want to tell you this morning, get your hope up. Get your hopes up, if that's proper. Hope. Get your hopes up. Expect, because we serve a God of abundance. We serve a God who changes water into wine. We serve a God who heals blind eyes. We serve a God that heals deaf ears. Who stops heart attacks. Who brings life. Amen? Amen. We need to get our hopes up. Amen. We need to be expectant. The other day, personally, I had this thought that came from the Lord. And this thought that came from the Lord got me excited. And you know what came about three seconds after that thought? Don't get your hopes up. Don't get your hopes up. Oh, you've said that for the last five years. You've said that for the... You've been telling people that for ten years. You've been thinking that. You've been saying that same thing. What do you think is going to change this time? That God's going to do it now. You've been saying the same thing. What I tell Stacy, just one more season, baby. One more season. Once we get through this season, change is coming. Change is coming. She's like, you said that last year. You said that two years ago. You said that three years ago. Listen, the other day the Lord saying, Cameron, one more season. And then quickly, my thought was, don't get your hopes up. So I said, devil, you're a liar. I'm going to get my hopes up again. I'm going to get my hopes up again. I'm going to live and dream and expect knowing that God has expected it. Amen? That God is the season changer. He's the game changer. He's the coach. He's the plan. The enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus says, I've come to give you life and life to the fullest. I've come to give you life in abundance. I've come to give you more than you can handle. If you can dream it, you got God's dreaming bigger. If you can think it, He's thinking bigger. If you can plan it, His plans are even more planned. If God has a word for you, which He does, He will fulfill the plans that He has for you. And everybody said, Amen. Get your hopes up. Willie said it this morning. If we're not careful, we'll get hopeless about America. We'll get hopeless about our economy. We'll get hopeless about our job. We'll get hopeless about our marriage, about our kids, about our health. We'll say things, well, this is my disease, my condition, my disease. And God says, get your hopes up 
I've conquered that disease. I've conquered that condition. I've conquered that ailment. That's not yours. You're a son or a daughter of the king. Give it to me. It's mine. You can't handle the label behind what you say. You can't handle cancer. You can't handle diabetes. You can't handle... So quit claiming it and bringing it on to yourself saying, this is mine. It's not yours. It's what's been put on you and it doesn't belong on you. God didn't create you for it. God created us to live forever. So anything that comes to squelch or to bring death did not come from God. So therefore, if you are God's and God lives in you and your temple, your body is His temple, then if it's not from Him, it's not yours. That's right. Amen? Amen. Look at second, the second chapter of Acts 17. It says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Say, God is pouring out His Spirit. God is pouring out His Spirit. On all flesh. See, the hopelessness of the world would say, in the last days, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. It's out of control. It's out of chaos. It's chaotic. Can't believe, can't believe what's allowed and what's acceptable. Can't believe the mind shift. Can't believe what's on TV. Can't believe what's coming across. Can't believe what they're teaching. Can't, can you believe it? And, and we will put all of our hope in that. And God says, listen, the closer it gets to my returning, I'm pouring out more of my spirit. The closer it comes to battle, the, the more intense the battle gets. Do you think God starts to get depleted? No, He starts to pour out more grace, more mercy, more prophecy, more words of knowledge, more wisdom, more healing, more tongues, more faith. He starts to pour out more of Himself. And what happens is we start to get rid of more of ourselves. We get to be a little less in control. As we start to lose control, sometimes we start to panic. Would you agree? Come on. I'm not the only one. As the Lord starts to fill up, I start to deplete. And then all of a sudden when I look twice, I'm like, oh my God, I can't control this. And God says, good, that's exactly where I want you. If you could control it, You'd be in control. But since I'm God, I'm in control. So therefore, I will always give you more than you can handle. Did you hear what I just said? Yes, sir. One of the biggest myths of Christianity is God will never give you more than you can handle, brother. Oh, God will never give you more than you can handle, sister. That's a lie. God will always give you more than you can handle. Otherwise, you wouldn't need Him. God will always put more on you. He will look at His disciples and say, hey, there's 5,000 hungry people out there. Go feed them. And the disciples go, well, how are we going to do that? I don't know. Go figure it out. Read it. <laughs> right? Hey, Noah, build an ark. What's that? It's a big boat. How big? 300 yards. Or 100 yards. 300 feet long. This high, this wide. As big as a football field. Are you kidding me? And then put all the animals in it. God will always give you more than you can handle. Amen. So that you will trust Him and say, I can't do this. And He'll go, good, that's exactly where I needed you to get. Now are you ready for me to lift that pressure or that struggle? Now are you ready for me to launch you to Africa? He's, he's put something in. He's put a thing that's impossible to you. He's put something. Amen? In the last days I will pour out my spirit. Your sons... And your daughters shall prophesy. Say prophesy. Prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. On my men servant and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Say prophesy. Prophesy. Ezekiel chapter 37, turn their mind. Just for the fact that his name is in the Bible, just because he wrote a book, just because God records his life does not make him a super Christian this invincible one that just had this awesome relationship with God. Ezekiel was a man. Ezekiel had a flesh nature. Ezekiel was struggled with greed and pride and lust and arrogance and, and, and fear and insecurity and doubt. He struggled with everything that you struggle with. David says there's no new sin. Solomon says there's no new sin under the sun that, uh, except that which is common to men. Every man that ever walked the earth, pastor or convict in jail, Hitler or Billy Graham has struggled with the same flesh sin. Ezekiel, a man of God, 
is struggling with what the Lord's fixing to tell him to do. I want to say this. There's power in your words. Say, I speak life. I speak life. Or you can speak death. In your mouth carries great weight. The words that you speak. What's prophecy? Prophecy is the words you speak. Come on. You, in the last days, can prophesy for the Lord, or you can prophesy for the enemy. You can speak life over America, or you can join forces with the enemy and continue to speak death. You can speak life over that illness that's coming against you, that came against your mama, that came against your grandmama, that came against your great-great-grandmama. Or you can join forces with the enemy and speak on his behalf. You can speak to poverty. You can speak to the mountain and tell it to be cast into the sea. Or you can join forces with the enemy and say, oh, that's impossible. I'll never get it. It's always been this way. It's always going to be this way. This is, this is a hopeless situation. Mm -hmm. This will never matter. This will never change. That guy, that girl, they're too old to change. How many times have I said that? How many times have I believed that lie? Mm -hmm. That guy's been that way all of his life. That girl's been that way. Man, man he'll never change. I've said that about family members. We tend to say that more about family members than anybody else. Would you agree? Oh, Uncle Joe, he's been that way forever. He'll never change. Really? So what we just said is, hey, God, yeah, I know you made dolphins. I know you spoke mountains into existence. I know that you control when volcanoes erupt and when they don't. God, I know that you delicately placed America, I mean, the world and the solar system with precision. But God, you can't change Uncle Joe. You're not that powerful. That's what we're saying. Look at Ezekiel chapter 37. It says this. And, and then God says to Ezekiel. Now listen to what God says right off the bat. Son of man. What is God reminding Ezekiel who he is? Hey, Ezekiel, son of a man. Hey, you're just a man. Hey, son of man. Can these bones live? Now to set the stage, Ezekiel was taken in the spirit by God to a valley. He was taken to a low place. He was taken to a place of desolation. In this valley were hundreds of thousands of bodies. It was an army that had been slaughtered. And the birds had come and ate their flesh and just the bones were left in this valley. So it speaks to a lot of circumstances we find ourselves in that sometimes the Lord takes us to a valley of death. Sometimes He takes us to a valley of desolation. Sometimes He takes us to a place that looks and appears hopeless. Sometimes He takes us to a nation that's been called, their, for decades, called their city the city of death. Did I say that right? The dead city. The dead city. Sometimes He takes us to the dead city. Sometimes He takes us to the dead sea. Sometimes He takes us to the river called the Red Sea and says, Hey Moses, yep, there's a big river in front of you. You've got six million Jews behind you. I don't know how you're going to get across. Sometimes he takes us to what we would call a valley and shows us the dry bones. So in this story, Ezekiel is taken to this valley of this giant great army, but this army has been devastated. This army has been destroyed. This, this army has been there so long, all that's left of them is bones. And he says, and he asks this question, he says, Hey, Ezekiel, can these bones live? Say that with me. Can these bones live? Can See, I think sometimes God takes me to an x-ray and he says, Hey, can I heal that black spot? See that x-ray? Man, that's pretty devastating. That's the biggest black spot on your lungs that the doctor's ever seen. That mass on that x-ray in your skull, that's the biggest, that's the worst valley the doctor's ever seen. This is, confound, this is confusing all the doctors. Hey, the counselor, the medic, the person, says, hopeless situation. Look at this valley. Can these bones live? 
Look at America. Let, let's take an overview of America. Can God bring His Spirit to America? Look at the school system. Look at Hollywood. Look at the judicial system. Look at the criminal system. Can God bring life to these bones? You fill in the blank. What's the valley that we're looking at? Hopeless or hopeful? Amen? So God asks Ezekiel, can I bring life to these dry bones? Can these dry bones live? Now, in my case, many times I've told God, nope, sure can't. Nope, because sometimes I don't want it to. Do you agree? Sometimes I'm like, nope, I'm comfortable like it is. I've gotten used to the cemetery. I've gotten used to the dry bones. I've gotten used to the stench and the smell and just the lack of friendship and the lack of hope and just the lack of excitement. Around. Yeah, this valley of death, I've, got, I've grown accustomed to it. See, we say that in things like this. I expected that from that guy. <laughs> She's just measuring up to what she always does. That's, that's just the way it is. You ever say stuff like that? Oh, yeah. God's asking us the question this morning. Can these dry bones live? I think the response is yours or I. Your, your, did I say that right? Mine or yours? How's that? <laughs> On my foot, right? <laughs> And he says to Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered. So Ezekiel answers the Lord, Oh Lord God. This guy's smart. Only you know. God, it looks hopeless to me. But God, only you know. Only you know if you can bring life. Look at verse 4. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Say that with me. O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Listen, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. God forms Adam out of the dust of the ground. God forms the shell. God forms the body. God forms the kneecap and the elbows and the eyes and the ears and the noses and the hair. God forms Adam to this perfection of a shell, this perfection of a man. He forms him out of the clay of the ground. He puts toenails on him. He puts all the the 30-something the, the layers of skin on him. He puts all the intricacies of his physical DNA. He forms them. The shell was there, amen? amen. But then Scripture says God breathed into Adam. And then Adam came alive. Science may clone one day the human cell, but science will never breathe life into beings. That's right. Amen? Amen. The question is this, or let me just read verse 4 again. Again, he says, prophesy to these bones. O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. O mountain, get out of my way. O disease, out of my way. O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. O death, O marriage issues, O child issues, O relate, O addiction. Cocaine, just hear the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. We speak life. Here is the power that you have. You today can choose to prophesy to the dread, dead bones, the dead places, the hopeless situations. You can speak life into them. Or you can prophesy death into them. We have to be very careful what we join our forces with. I can be driving to the office... And I could be speaking, oh man, it's Monday, my boss is going to be in a bad mood. My boss is always in a bad mood on Monday. Mondays are horrible. Mondays are just, everybody's in a bad mood. It's so much stressful. We're already behind, you know, on Mondays, we're already three days behind schedule. You can be prophesying that on your way to work. And you know what will bring light to that? Exactly what you said. The office will be chaotic. People will be in a bad mood because you've already prophesied it. 
You've already spoken. You've already anticipated it. And you've already spoken that over that situation. Or you could be prophesying life. You could be prophesying sales. You could be prophesying good leads. You could be prophesying over the office atmosphere. You could be speaking. This is the day the Lord has made. I will choose to be glad. I'll choose to rejoice. It's going to be, yeah, I know what the reports are. I know what the situation is. I know that we're behind on this. And I know production's back here. But listen, in the name of Jesus, it's going to be a great day. We're going to be more productive than we've ever been. We're going to have more sales. I'm going to have favor with my boss because i got favor with God. I'm going to change the atmosphere. I'm going to speak life. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit. My sons and my daughters will prophesy. I think God's given us huge, huge responsibility. In the name of Jesus, I'm speaking life. Second Chronicles says, if my people will humble themselves, if my people will humble themselves, call upon me, pray, repent, I'll turn and I'll heal their land. I'll turn and I'll heal their mind. I'll heal that dementia. I'll heal that illness. I'll heal that relationship. I'll, if my people, amen? Amen. You have great power in your words. You do prophesy. See, we put this thing, prophecy, in this spiritual gift category that only one or two people have, only one or twice times a year, and they get these special words. And yes, there are prophets, and there is the gift of prophecy. But the Scripture says that we all are prophets for God. We all are preachers. You're a preacher. No, I'm not. I never went to seminary. I don't care. I don't have a church. Yeah, you do. It's your cubicle at work. That's right. It's your neighborhood. It's mowing you. It's it's at the grocery store. God didn't just you didn't just jump in line seven because it was shorter. That's right. God orchestrated that because you're supposed to prophesy to that cashier. You're supposed to prophesy to that person in front of you or behind you. The other day I was not in a very good mood and I was at work and I was being very cordial and very nice to this customer and I was just kind of doing the thing. And the Lord spoke to me and said, oh, that customer is a believer. And told me to carry on a conversation about him. So I didn't. I was in a bad mood. <laughs> I just was trying to get the job done and get on my way. You know what the Lord did? I opened my mouth. And this is all I said. Man, you got a great yard. It's really big. That's all I said to him because I'm installing an inflatable in his backyard because he was watching me. So I had to talk. <laughs> and you know what the guy said? Man, the Lord blessed us with this place. They made a mistake on the, the property and they gave us 10 extra feet over here and the builder, after he did it, he realized his mistake and we got the largest yard in the neighborhood. The Lord really blessed us. Amen. So the Lord was like... <laughs> <laughs> then I started to prophesy. Then I started to speak life after I said, God, forgive me. Then this backyard in this guy's neighborhood, he starts to tear up as he starts to talk to me about what God's doing and what he was walking through. Amen? Amen. You are a prophet. Yep. Prophesy. Choose your words wisely. Why is gossip so deadly? Why is gossip such a trap of the enemy? Because, oh, you'll sit there and you will prophesy trash. You will prophesy darkness. The Bible says don't even speak about deeds of darkness. Don't even relay what was done on that crime scene. Don't even convey what was said in that back deep dark deep dark secret oh let me just tell you what they said let me just tell you oh just one more thing let me, let me just tell you one more thing before we go about this why is it so because we're prophesying death and sin 
Jesus spoke life. He said, ears be open, eyes open, hearts open. Mountains move. Goliaths die. Winds, storms stop. Calm. See, some of us just need to go to our workplace and speak to the storm. They're just saying the name of Jesus, peace is coming in here because I got on the shoes of peace and everywhere I go, there's going to be peace today. There's going to be peace in my cubicle. Even if that's the only place you can have, you just speak peace around your territory. Amen? Amen. Prophesy, church. Prophesy to dead places. I think it's a challenge. God, I've considered this dead. And I think here's the question. God says, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's response was, only you know God. So then God says, prophesy and speak to these dead bones that they will live. Amen? Amen. Amen. Speak life. Whatever you're walking through, speak life. Listen, you may still walk through the valley. You may still be in that place. But you speak life. In the power of our mouths is life and death. Amen? Amen. Father God, we love you. And God, I pray that we will prophesy. I just want to speak this church. This past week, America's ruling from the Supreme Court has caused a lot of people to speak death and doom and gloom and hopelessness and despair. Speak life. Speak life. Speak life. God is alive and well in America. America is a place That God reigns. Amen. That's our declaration. Amen? Amen. Speak life to people. Be cautious what comes out of our mouth. Speak life. Father, we love you and we bless you. And oh God, forgive us when we speak things contrary to your word. Can these dry bones live? Only you know, God. Then prophesy, speak to him. Peter said, hey Jesus, is that you? If it is you, tell me to get out of the boat and walk on water. What did Jesus say? Well, come on. Hey Jesus, is that you? Are you in that? Are you still in this? Lord will tell you when and when not to speak. Amen? Amen? Father, we love you and we bless you. And we pray that you would be honored. And God, we have hope and we have life to the fullest, abundantly in you. In the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.